Are there any other photos you would like to see? They look really very nice and uh, amazing. Let me uh, show you something or the audience something is something very interesting to me. You know, I'm continuing to do, trying to do primary source research. And I always had this pin in my, my safety deposit box at the bank. And I, I never knew what this was. I thought maybe it was something that she got at maybe a fair or, or something because, you know, I think photography was somewhat new. Uh, and so it's a little pin on the back and is I never that under I, gloss? It's a gloss or no, it's it's um just a little photo that's put over a kind of brooch backing. Okay, all right, yeah. And then I went to a library where I could access a local newspaper, and in that newspaper, which I had never seen because the newspaper uh, wasn't available and I know Nina I know you you have access to a lot of newspapers um and I I would like to cross check our resources at some point because you just have thousands and thousands and thousands of newspaper articles about Carpathia and um Captain Rostrin but for whatever reason, this local paper, paper was only available in this one library. So I went and I was amazed to see that found in the paper. And you can see that it was the pin. And what it says, and I never knew this, um, it says that they went to his tenement my great grandfather in my hometown, and he showed them to him to the newspaper reporter, and they were things that she had given to him, knowing that they were going to be apart for those eight months. So oh, she had given him the pin, and given him a picture of of the baby, and he held on to those. I see. Wow. And I never knew that. I never knew. And so I was able to access this paper and I find think it. I, I saw it, but I didn't realize. Uh, can, can you show which, which paper it is, which newspaper? It's um, called, um, well, the Norfolk. The Ledger, Ledger Dispatch. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Because I, I remember the central uh, of um, uh, the um, major bat. Uh, the, the central picture, I think it's a, the collate of different pictures. And I saw it somewhere else. I need to check my archive. <laughs> yes. At some time, I will look forward to coming over. And uh, of course, I still have family in, in London. Um, who really? Because, yes. Well, Leah's brother, Solomon, he didn't leave he stayed there and made his home in in yeah. the uk and had all of his children and all of his grandchildren great-grandchildren are still there and so wow. they're my cousins and you know i have been over to to uh visit them so Which it was oh it is where where where, they, where where do they live they live uh in suburbs around london like um i think one of the places is called barnett okay yeah mm -hmm. i know um but i i was in london uh in 2018 um and i interviewed uh my great uncle solomon's youngest daughter Okay. Who was at the time 101 years old? <gasps> wow. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so and she would have received a letter from, from the Queen. Whoever gets 100 years old receives a special letter from the Queen. 
Well, also, I didn't see that letter, but I they showed me proudly um, a little certificate or a letter for the 50th wedding anniversary. Okay. Yeah. From the queen and signed. Yeah. Yes, yes. So yeah. I, I suppose that's something that happens if you are married for 50 years. You, yes. <laughs> you get a, a letter from the queen. So... And they were very proud of that. But yeah, it's my great grandmother had um, three brothers. Um, one of them, Abraham, was very, very close to a sister. And he he basically emigrated. And guess what ship he came over on? No, you have to guess. M Mauritania, Carpathia. <laughs> no. Olympic. Olympic. Wow. Yeah. So they still they still uh, trusted the the white star. <laughs> well, after all this, no Olympic was good, and Captain Haddock was very good actually. Uh, it's a yeah. completely different story comparing the captains and so on. Uh, I don't know whether you, you, you knew, but this is just a, a, a simple fact that Haddock was a very good friend of Rostron. And despite of them belonging to different com competing shipping companies, they were friendly very much and they socialized with families quite often together. So when he was sending these um, messages to Olympic, uh, like um, uh, Captain Haddock suggested tra transferring the, the survivors back Imagine those people just climbed over to then they get them back into the lifeboats. It was just unbelievable. He, he had it probably didn't realize what state those people were in because he didn't see them. So he suggested he will take over to, the, to the, the, those people to New York. But Rostron said, I don't think so. I, I don't think so. And obviously you can see the way they interact with each other that they are quite comfortable because it wasn't very official type of the, the interaction. He was saying, please stand by, I will send you the names, uh, please stand by, or also, I, don't, I personally don't think so that it's good for you at all to be seen by them. So Olympic was, was hiding, if you wish, from the view of the survivors. So because, because it was an, an exact cop, not exact from the uh, probably um, experts uh, type of, of the, 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 the point of view, because for example, there were some uh, slight changes in the bridge. They were, they, they were not identical, the bridges of Olympic and Titanic, but uh, obviously from a distance, it was exactly the same. And uh, all those women suddenly thinking this is a ghost and maybe the Titanic survived and maybe their love, loved ones are still there. And interestingly, someone also mentioned, and I'm another thing that we don't ne never particularly reflect about. First of all, as I said, he was risking his career when he rushed towards, uh, towards Titanic. But second also was that he was the only one actually thinking about survivors and their, their state of mind. He was the one who wanted to protect them even from distress. The it didn't appear to Haddock. It didn't appear to um, even Ismail. Ismail was in a bad, very bad state anyway, but um, he was the one saying, well, you, I don't want them to see you, to see the Olympic, because they might get, you know, in, in, a, in a hysterical state of those ladies thinking, well, the ship is still there. Can you imagine that that's awful? So therefore he was also, I think the only one who was um, feeling like in the same uh, or tuned, tuned to those people emotionally. Well, he, as you said, he laid his eyes on them. He knew they were in a horrific state. Yes, yes. And, you know, not only the passengers, but as you also mentioned, uh, Ismay, uh, and also, I love the story of um, Officer Boxhall off the yes, Titanic. Yes, and he, yes. He's the first officer to, to go up on the deck and to see Captain Rostron. And Rostron, you know, says, son, what happened, you know, to the Titanic? And he said that it foundered at 240 and just balls his eyes out. Yes. And then I would like you to tell 
the listeners what it um he, he broke down really because you know he was saying that he he said interestingly he said she was doomed she was doomed from the very beginning they, these were the the words of, of boxel i mean i'm pretty sure they were just said because he was in in, in distress um i don't know if she meant anything in particular but she said she was doomed that, that were his words. And um, there was kind of a one minute silence. And then Rostron said, put his arm, a hand on his arm and said, now go down son and uh, everything is now finished for, for, for you. It's, it's behind you and, and uh, have, have some, some tea and coffee or coffee, have some coffee and, and uh, get, get yourself warm and, and uh, comfortable. These were his words. So he sent him off from there. But he was, <clears throat> I think, <clears throat> against all the odds, it was impossible for him to get there. He was, to, what, two, two, uh, three hours late, yes? Uh, two hours late. It was almost impossible for him to get there on time. But um, it, until the end, he couldn't really, he is still, uh, until the end of his life, he was um, against all odds. Um, uh, thinking and feeling that something else could have been done. And uh, he couldn't um, kind of take it in that he, he wasn't able to get, sorry, what I'm saying, it's an hour and a half he was, he was only late uh, because it took him another four hours to pick up all the, all the lifeboats. So he was only an hour and a half, but she couldn't fly. Carpathia. She did her best with uh, sometimes, not always, but at some stages going with 17 knots. Uh, I believe in that absolutely, although some people contest it. But now after this discovery that her average uh, speed was 15, because they, they always the comment was the argument was she was 13 knots. She couldn't travel at, at, at 17. Sorry, she was 15 knots. So therefore, she, she um, easily could have uh, made a 17. So he, he couldn't kind of uh, um, uh, take it in uh, that, that he, he didn't save the whole because he was prepared to the extent that even they found space for, for Titanic post, for the Titanic mail, because the Titanic was taking a lot of mail. They found that they emptied the space for the mail of Titanic. The, the lifeboats were ready and, and the, um, uh, the lowered down on, on both sides, uh, on both, both ports in order to sail because obviously he knew there were not enough number of lifeboats on Titanic for all the passengers. So his own lifeboats was ready, were ready to go. And uh, um, uh, so therefore he found this um, uh, space for May left. He was prepared to get the whole of the ship uh, on board, but, and he's just, um, yeah. <clears throat> what <clears throat> also is interesting that throughout his career, uh, Roston, uh, and he says he's in his own uh, um, um, biography, uh, Home from the Sea, uh, that he never lost a single passenger never a single passenger throughout the whole these 42 years in, on, on the sea. Only one passenger who killed himself and he was one of the uh, troops that he was, the word is trooping, uh, he was taking from, from, from the US or from, from the US to the, um, to the um, Mediterranean as a part of the, uh, the First uh, World War, the Great War. And that uh, uh, young man, he was a soldier and he was of German uh, origin. So he, he killed himself aboard the, 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 the ship because he didn't want to, to go to fight his, um, his own, if you wish. Although he was American citizen, he was uh, recruited by, by the, by, by the US, but that was the only case where he lost a passenger. And uh, uh, this was the first time on Carpathia that he had to uh, uh, um, play a role of the V car to, um, to bury the, um, the uh, four um, uh, the, uh, sailors from, from Titanic who died already after being rescued on the car. And um, I, if I remember it correctly, uh, the um, Hungarian doctor, uh, the Arpad Lentiel, 
who uh, was uh, there, of course, present, he said that he was almost um, close to collapsing uh, with uh, Rostrum because he was so upset by the fact that, you know, he was um, um, burying those people. He was always, always very, um, uh, um, I wouldn't say that not, not kind is not the word, but feeling for people. And he was as one of the, um, quite a, um, a long time after, after uh, Carpathia, um, mentioned one of the newspaper men who was aboard, I think it was Mauritania, said he was as kind as a summer day about Rostrum. <laughs> so for him, he felt for this. He felt that, you know, everything that was happening on the ship, like it was his responsibility. I read something um, recently and they were talking about uh, his time, I think on the Mauritania, uh, that it was difficult for him because of course that being the flagship, this most amazing ship mm -hmm. that he was expected to, to some degree, entertain yes. the first class passengers and that this is not something that he found to be very easy. It was not this really. A, this is a very interesting, um, um, the, the, it, it's good that you mentioned it because if you don't mind, I would say this is a great misconception. And I read it in a couple of places uh, and I think the initial, the initial, uh, the as usually it happens, someone writes something and then people are reproducing it. Yes. So initial publication meant um, and and actually uh, quoted him saying that, that there are three uh, ports to a ship. One is a a, a, a star port. Uh, the the star what's called the star side. The second is a port side. Three three sides, a star side, port side, and the and the passengers. And someone, uh, it was just a quote, and it wasn't in any way negatively actually charged. And someone misinterpreted this as like he was complaining. I think Rostrum was the most, as according to Bissett, the most natural and the most willing host on his ship. And when he said that there are those three sides to the, the port side, the, the star side and the passengers, he actually meant it in a positive way, that this is your responsibility, you have to, because what Bissett was saying is that he always encouraged them to mix with the, with, with the past passengers, to, to dance with passengers, to go with passengers to the excursions together. And Bissett said that the, the most, the, the, um, he's been, he had really very rich career before and after, but he said, my best time I spent on, on Carpathia during those cruises, because, because of this. Um, in, and if you see uh, a lot of uh, photos of, of Rostrum being together with passengers all the time. So I think he enjoyed it very much. And um, uh, also there was a slogan uh, of uh, Mauritania being a happy ship. She, she was called a happy ship. And when he moved to Berengaria, they were called her Berengaria with a smile, meaning his smile and the smile for the, for the passengers. So um, I think um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a quote which was incorrectly uh, interpreted. <laughs> that, that, that's my, let's say, research, the result of my research into this. <laughs> I think this is fascinating. I'm truly learning so much about my hero who, yeah. you know, the Baron Garia is the third of the three massive German liners. Yes. In that, mm -hmm. And the other two, Leah Axe, Titanic survivor, was actually on the Majestic and the yeah. Leviathan. Yes. Only one of those three she was not on was the Berengaria. Yes. Yeah. Well, she was a traveler. <laughs> Definitely. You know, more, more than that, um, as traumatized as she was, I think decade by decade, she got better. Yes. And my, her husband, my great grandfather was quite a character. 
he had a terrible, terrible experience as a young man getting out of Europe. He was from um, a village called Woj, which L-O-D-Z, and there were terrible- uh, in, Pol in Poland. Yes. Lodz, yes. At the time, mm -hmm. Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, and there were terrible anti-Jewish violence. Yes. And I believe that his father was killed around 1904. And so his mother was left with just, you know, a lot of children. And so my great grandfather and his brother just started walking basically out of Europe to try to get her out. And they, the only thing that they had to use to sustain themselves was that they were boxers and wow. boxing was quite big at the tournaments. Yes, absolutely. Always has been in the US, isn't it? And particularly yes. at that time, yes. So he and his brother would box each other or box other people, but that's how they might've made some money. And then they finally earned enough to go over to London. Well, my great grandfather was determined, absolutely determined that he wanted to be an American. So he could work in cars. He was very interested in cars. So once in London, he worked and at, then in 1908 came over the first time on the uh, steamship Celtic mm -hmm. and got over with his brother Abraham to the United States. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately he had caught the chicken pox. Oh. So got to Ellis Island and was turned away and they put him oh. right on the Celtic the next day and sent him back to, to London. But Chicken if he is not a big deal, so why did they why why were they so strict about it? <laughs> you know, his brother got in. I I think um, you know, I've heard varying things uh, about immigration at Ellis Island and maybe that even if a woman was pregnant sometimes or or very advanced stage of pregnancy they might send her back i i'm not exactly sure but uh any kind of illness like that and so when he got back that's when he met leah and it was meant uh, to be <laughs> it, again meant to be and so again started earning the money to come over again and uh, which he did in September of 1911. And then she came over, well, most of the way on the Titanic. And then of course, uh, on the Carpathia, uh, but he wasn't there to meet her in New York. And I just basically learned why through these newspapers that I couldn't get anywhere else. Um, she was cared for by the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, yeah. as were uh, quite a number of people. Yes. Yeah, yeah, quite a lot. Uh, yeah. or, or other aid agencies, Red yeah, Crescent. There, there were quite a few of the agencies that were created straight away, or the agencies that came in to, to, to take care of the... They, they took good care in the US of, of the survivors, I must say, yes. I think they, they tried to. I know there was some problem in St. Vincent's with, unfortunately, uh, lawyers for the White Star came in and tried to get them to sign away. But I think they did try to make every effort. <clears throat> but my great grandfather did not know that she had survived because they couldn't transmit the names of the third class survivors. Yes, and they did. Yeah. At the very end, when uh, when the um, the um, they were already very close to New York, they started to 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 because of, of the of the capacity of the um, the Marconi um, uh, equipment on Carpathia was really very limited. So therefore, only where they met, they were in the radius of of other ships. They could have tra tra transferred something. Yes, and they probably were not so many 
survivors from the third class, were they? No. Yeah. Sadly, but so he wasn't there to meet her because I actually found in the newspaper that uh, when he was notified was basically on the 18th. Yes, yes, yeah, exactly. And an agent for the Whites, a local agent for the White Star came to his place of residence. Um, I believe the guy's name was Henry Brandt and notified him to his shock that his wife and baby had survived. And of course he had no idea. And this was Thursday and, yes. you know, Monday, there was already news in the newspaper that the Titanic had sunk. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, he yep. was quite beside himself. Um, and her parents in London thought she was dead. So the first day, uh, they, oh, they actually had very kind of a positive type of someone inflated those positive news that the Titanic is being uh, uh, the um, taken by by another ship to, to to Boston for some reason to Boston, or, or that everyone has been distributed between three or four ships and everything is fine. The first day was very positive, and then when Olympic finally relayed the information from Carpathia to to the shore, that's when they knew what happened. You know, it's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, that, well, this reminds me, and then I'll go back to my story about how my great-grandfather finally got up there, but the fact that Captain Haddock had been the person in the White Star Line who took, I believe, and you can correct me, but when they took possession of the Titanic, Captain Haddock brought her down to Southampton. Uh, when, when did it? Uh, oh, you mean uh, he prepared it for for this for the sale, uh, like uh, the 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 trial the tri trial sale sale or? No, uh, when they had finished the Titanic in Belfast, yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, they needed to get for the sea trials, they needed to get the Titanic. Uh, yeah, okay, I didn't know that. I didn't know it at all. That's really very interesting. Yeah, had it was. I, I, I wish he was the captain on the day. I will, I will, I will say nothing more, but. Hmm. So, um, so then I, and I found so much out hmm. from going to this, this library that the next day or something, he had arranged for her to come down on the train. And of course the, the quickest way would be for her, since we live on the uh, east coast of mm -hmm. the state, to come right down from New York, you could take a, a ferry right <laughs> down to my hometown. Well, she didn't want to do it. No, right? I guess she wouldn't. And that ex exactly confirms that imagine that if they were told we are transferring you to 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 uh, Olympic, just just go that again down into the lifeboats and you will be taken by sea to the. Olympic. She even didn't want to take the ferry, so it, it's obvious that it was a, a really not a, well ill-conceived idea. Let's say it was. So uh, I saw in the newspaper where he said she's going to arrive. He was still in my hometown. She's mm -hmm. going to arrive by train tomorrow. Well, then that didn't happen. And then it wasn't until Saturday night in the newspaper where they said he was going up to get her and bring her back. Well, I don't think she was well enough to travel by herself on the train. Sadly, it's really sad that, you know, she said, I, I can't do it. I've, I've had it. You know, I, Yes, I yeah. went from London to Southampton on the train by myself and I got on the Titanic and I got on the Carpathia and I got to New York and I just can't do this by myself. Mm -hmm. And I think she was really very unwell. Yes, of course she would have been, particularly if, if this, is the, this is correct and she only found the baby on the fourth day, so like, like five days of agony 
the whole situation, climbing there, losing the baby, uh, waiting for the in, in the dark for 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 a, the rescue, then uh, living in a hell for four days without or thinking, not without knowing, but thinking that the baby is lost, and then finally only find, finding. I mean, she she went through um, really a lot. She went through I, amazing that she really kept herself together. So he went up, I found uh, my husband and I, we took our family, went to New York and we went to the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society. Mm -hmm. And I said, I'm looking for information and they were able to find the landing card, mm -hmm. um, which said that he had arrived on the 22nd and at 7 p.m. he picked them up and with a guide, they uh, went, the guide, I guess, took them yeah. to the mm -hmm. Pennsylvania Railroad. And so what I found out that this isn't a night trip. So you get on the, that's why it was so late at night. Yeah. Uh, they went to the Pennsylvania Railroad and at 7 yes. p.m. they took the overnight train to my hometown. Um, but it was fascinating because I've learn you know so many other details it's incredible you know you did really great research on on all this even knowing the you know a step by step what they were doing it's it's absolutely great i was i wonder whether uh, uh, the baby himself remembered anything it's very probably not but uh, just wonder sometimes uh, sometimes People do remember things from very, very early age, particularly if they were stressful or, or, or joyful or whatever. I personally remember when I was even not walking yet, several episodes from my life. Yes. Wow. So I, just wonder, uh, I just wonder whether he remembered anything at all. No, he, he did uh, hundreds of interviews and he always said, I don't remember anything. Yes, yeah. But I have to tell you one more amazing Carpathia kind of story. Yeah. I, in 2018, I mentioned to you that I, I went to London, I saw my cousins and talked to, you know, the one that was so elderly. And uh, she actually gave me a piece of information, which I thought was very interesting. She was um, seven when mm -hmm. the Titanic, so she doesn't remember a lot, but she just kept saying nasty business that nasty yeah, business. Yeah, um, <laughs> very, but, very British word actually, nasty. <laughs> <Very nasty. British. laughs> um, so she, you know, I was asking her for more details on when they came over or how, uh, was my great grandmother, I believe came over from, uh, she was from Warsaw so close to where my great grandfather was from, they didn't know each other mm -hmm. uh, when she was about five. So probably around 1899, 1900. So I said, do you know anything about any of that? She said, well, you know, my father came first and he, they were afraid that he was gonna get conscripted into the Russian army as a young man. So they sent wow. uh, him over first. Uh -huh. So he wouldn't be taken into the Russian army. I never knew that. So he's the one, Solomon is the one who, her brother Solomon, who then worked and brought his, his parents and his two brothers and sister over to London. So that was, wow. you know, I love, kind of putting together in my mind where I found any one tiny little piece of information. Um, Are you going to write about this history of your family? You can, you can start so early, you know, from, from, from the very beginning, from the, um, uh, the origin, let's say, and then, then, then going, the, moving on towards this Carpathia uh, and uh, the culmination with the Titanic and then Carpathia's um, rescue. I, I'm planning to do that. That is the plan. I'm, 
you know, I retired recently and um, then we moved and, you know, just uh, I have been doing a lot of research along the way and I have a lot of information, but I still, there's a few bits I still need. And uh, I, what's important to me is to try to, to not repeat stories from my childhood that I heard or to like the one about Madeline Astor on the Titanic grabbing the scarf. Because when you just accept what you were told by your family, or when you accept even what you see in the movies or read in the books or on the internet, so often so much of that information can be wrong. Just like I give you an example of, uh, of uh, Rostrom being a very willing uh, host and actually liking it very much. And they just incorrectly interpret it. They, they, it's a correct quote. The quote is, is, is correct, but incorrect interpreted. What he was saying is that when you are a captain, these are your duties. So this, the, 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 the star, uh, the port, the, 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 sorry, star side, the port side, and the, the passengers. So he was saying it as, a, as an important part of, of, of your duties. Not, not that he didn't like it. <laughs> but you know what I was thinking? If you are kind of uh, considering the movie about Carpathia, the best thing would be to put your family in the center of this. It will be so interesting. No one, this is like a small episode everywhere. For example, I, when you were, um, uh, the, the, I, I kind of imagined again the, um, the, the, the same, my favorite movie, A Night to Remember. There, there is a lost small, but a, a, big, a bigger boy, like of two or three years old. Remember the, the one that is left uh, accidentally by, by his mother and the mother is in the lifeboat, but the small child is there and, and they're comforted by, by an old man, an, an old steward, and they, they die together. And I was thinking that's what probably was what was going through her mind. That's what she was, she was thinking happened. And they, they might have taken this story, but interp not interpreted by kind of dramatized it in a different way. Uh, there was a woman who lost a child. Uh, in, in the movie. So therefore that will be, but no one really, uh, th this is a very amazing story about a, a lost and returned uh, son and so on. But if you, if you uh, focus on the, the movie on your family, then it becomes entirely original. I think, you know, people said, you, you've got to write this down. You've got to write the story. Um, I remember talking to someone kind of uh, who had a museum and she and I said, you know, I'm just waiting because I don't I'm not sure yet what the best way is to organize it. Do I just want to write a very cold, descriptive book, clinical, uh, you know, about her life and before, during and then after? Uh, or do I want to uh, add more? Do I want to really, you know, talk about the bigger picture? So, for instance, what they went through even before, like in Europe, like my great grandfather, mm -hmm. yep. I think his story is so interesting. And the fact that it happened to both of them, think about that, yeah. Yeah. that they had that shared kind of trauma of trying to come over and emigrate. And so you have to tell more than just her story. Yes. And uh, but then, yeah, but then it becomes more epic. And uh, I think it's also very interesting. I think that there are two ways. One, if you would like to write a scenario, then <clears throat> scenario is more, as you said, clinical and, uh, and uh, more, um, although of course they would be emotional, but like emotions at the break, it's, he the tears appeared on on his in in his eyes or or um, uh, she felt uh, she she's shaken or something like that but that's th this this is still a very descriptive and uh, um, um very uh cold way of uh, the scenario can cannot be otherwise but um if you would like to write a book of course it's it's entirely different approach and different style 
and Bruce would be very much welcome. And um, now that you mentioned the movie about uh, Carpathia, I'm very much keen on you to do this scenario. <laughs> well, I, I mm -hmm. see you as a great resource. And again, I have to tell you, and I, I feel very much like my great grandmother is leading me places, that she's helping me. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and I tell you a good example of that. When I went to London in 2018, my father convinced me, he said, they have these cheap flights. Why don't you go to the, to Belfast just for a day and, uh, visit the museum and, and the, you know, the whole place that she was built. And so I said, okay, well, I'll do it. So I contacted another Facebook friend of mine that I had uh, met in Belfast. His name is John McDonald. And I said- I know I, him. He's a member of my, my, my uh, this group. He is, yes. He exactly. contributed a couple of very interesting photographs. He took a photo of the photo exhibited there uh, of uh, Rostrom with his wife and with his uh, el um, eldest son and the two grandchildren. And he gave gave them to a kind of donated to the to the group. He's wonderful. Yeah, he's yeah. Uh, he is absolutely wonderful, and he does a lot of photography. He does really beautiful photography, but yeah. he's very into that, mm -hmm. and he's extremely knowledgeable. And so I said, "Would you be able to take a day off work and and go with me when I go around Belfast?" He and he checked. He said, "Yes, I would love to." So, and I had known him for years uh, on Facebook and we also are both musicians. So we shared that in common. So I meet him and uh, I had emailed the uh, Belfast Titanic Museum the night before. And I said, I'm a descendant of Leah Axe and um, I'd like to come to museum. And usually if you do that, they'll let you in for free. And so I, when I went, they said, yes, this is wonderful. We'd like you to come to the office first and then we'll talk to you. I said, fantastic. So when I go there, I said, I'll be there right at 10 o'clock. There were cameras and everything. And they said, wow. literally, they said to me, is your grandmother, Sarah Carpathia? <laughs> I said, yes. Yeah. I, and they said, uh, do you have pictures of her? I said, well, yes, but I mean, it was her mother that was on the Titanic. And they said, no, 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 no never mind. Do you have pictures of your grandmother, Sarah Carpathia? And they said, do you have them with you? And I'm like, yes, because I had my iPad. And I'm very confused. I'm scratching my head thinking, what is this about? And they said, and it was June, okay? June, think what happened in 1918? What happened? I'm asking you as a as a Carpathia expert. Well, uh, the, the 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 fact that she was she she um, uh, sank. The Carpathia sank. What month? Uh, I think it was. It was in June, wasn't it? No, it was July. It was July. Okay, yeah, it was summer. Yes, yeah. I'm so, not so. As I said, I'm not so much Carpath. Carpathia period is mine when Rostrom was in charge. I'm definitely a Rostrom expert, <laughs> but uh, of course I know about Carpathia uh, after and before as much as it just comes um, uh, together with the information about Rostrom. But I'm not specifically following the the ship before and after. Uh, of course, I know that pr pr the um, what happened to it, but uh, to her really. But I wouldn't know whether it was June or July. It was summer in in, in the 1918, the last year of the war, mm -hmm. really, the last months of the war. Several months later, the uh, it was over. Mm. Well, so I'm like, you know, what is happening? Why are you asking me all this about my grandmother? And they said, well we're doing, we're honoring the Carpathia next month in an exhibit because mm -hmm. 
she was torpedoed and sunk yeah. next month, a hundred years. And I said, Oh, okay. And they said, we're doing a whole exhibit and wow. we invited Captain Rostron's two daughters to come over and, and the great exhibit. granddaughters, great, great granddaughters. Great grand granddaughters, yes. Mm -hmm. And I said, Oh, that's fantastic. And, and they said, We've been looking for you. I said, What? And they <laughs> said, Because you have a great human interest story. Yes. Where exactly. Captain Rostron, you know, helped with the baby. And exactly. we think that that would be very moving for his family members. And I said, oh, great. And so they said, here are your tickets, go and walk around and then come back. Uh, and we're, we'd like to, you know, take some photos and, and have an interview. I said, okay. And it was craziness. And I really believe that that was meant to be. And they, they did the whole exhibit basically around my grandmother, not my great grandmother, but my grandmother. Sarah that, that's the story that's the story and uh, you know you can even start with I don't know how maybe a scenario maybe um, uh, recalling reminiscing you know what what her mother was telling her about the whole situation and and uh, the, the rescue and then not only rescue the whole of her life really and uh, this would be a good kind of beginning of the movie and then it can go retrospectively towards the roots of the family and uh, then the whole story leading to the um, to the most dramatic part well I said most dramatic but your family went through so many dramatic parts in their in, in, in their life that that of course Titanic was dramatic but um, nevertheless what happened at the very beginning with them mm -hmm. was even even perhaps more horrible well, Absolutely. I think that maybe even that could have been part of, it, it was all part of her, her trauma and her yes. Yes. situation. Yeah. Uh, so, I, it, but my point is meeting you and interacting with you, I honestly believe she had a hand in it. Uh, just mm -hmm. like just on the spur of the moment, going to Belfast, yes. which I was not planning to do, and then say that they were looking for me and yes. that they wanted to make this whole thing about my grandmother. And, yes. you know, everywhere I go, I, I get these wonderful experiences and meet wonderful people. And I, I just, I, and even just going to that library, um, and finding that I actually have that pin. Yes, this, this is amazing. And it's also so exciting when you find the, um, um, the uh, I would say, um, not, not only the, the um, uh, description, but also the reasons for the things that are happening. And you, you find really a, uh, the whole story behind a small subject like, like this pin. Um, yeah, and so, I, I, I think you have a, such a great story to tell the world, really. Thank you. Independent story, which, which is uh, uh, deep um, uh, on its own because of the, the whole story of the family. It's not just a small episode of this one particular night. It's true. And you know, what is the old saying, may you live in, in interesting times. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> that time fascinates me, you know, everything mm. about it. You know, they went from not having electricity and, yes. you know, ha maybe having a, a horse and a buggy and um, to in their lifetime seeing space flight. Yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, a commercial air flight. And, you know, it's, it's an incredible time in history, their lifespans. Yeah, I agree. I agree. That's probably why it fascinates us so much and uh, why it attracts us, not just only because there were other, well, for example, interestingly, um, well, tragically again, but Lusitania 
was uh, no less a, a tragedy in, and a lot of people uh, perished there, but somehow maybe because it was a war uh, and uh, the Titanic sank without a reason, let's say, but uh, somehow the, the, the whole attention, this Titanic story attracts more attention, more emotions than for example, the tragedy with, with Lusitania. And um, why do you think that is? What, why are people so captivated by this? I, I think that there is a little bit of the faith in this because, um, and also, and also, there is a mystery. There are two things I think that fascinate people. First of all, you know, the maiden voyage, the very first one, and the the the, the ship sank, sinks. With with Lusitania, it is clear it was it it was torpedoed. So there there is no mystery in it. And then the mystery on the, all those conspiratory theories, and that someone wanted it to be, so someone uh, they, they wanted it to, to 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 be sunk because of of many other many reasons. There are quite a lot of con, uh, the conspiratory theories. So I think that the mystery, to a certain extent, the fact that uh, something that was one out of ten thousand chances, and this chance chance happened. I mean, uh, there were quite a lot of chances of being torpedoed during the war, but here it was a, a, so really a, a extremely rare, uh, uh, the unfortunate uh, uh, fact and circumstances that happened. And that attracts, constantly attracts people's attention. First of all, it wasn't Titanic, it was Olympic, or it was uh, someone wanted it to sunk because of the type of the people, the uh, financial uh, uh, kind of, um, uh, important people that were traveling with that. And um, that's why people are fascinated, I think. It's a mystery. It's a mystery. And also that's a situation, night, moonless night, uh, uh, and uh, the whole kind of the story and the picture um, is, is, uh, is uh, I think, playing up the imagination. So, um, you know, I, I have to laugh you know, it, it, when you have studied this historical event like you have and like I have, if, if I were to write a book of fiction and send it to a publisher and simply write the story and document it like we know it happened, they would, and, but they thought it was fiction. I, I can only believe that they would send that book back to me and say, you know, it's, it's a compelling story. I really like it, but it's the way you've written it, it it's not good fiction because it's so completely unbelievable that <laughs> I don't think people really get it. So if you take it back and you take out half of all of these bizarre things, I think it'd be a lot more enjoyable for people and they might actually believe it as, as a kind of fiction story. But as it is now, it's just unbelievable and just too much. But it, it's all true. It's true, but people can't tell you that because everyone knows about the Titanic and that unbelievable happened. And uh, therefore, they can't, they can't, in, in your case, I mean, we, we know the, the, the facts. So they, well, we know that is the fact. What you are telling is the story of, the, of, a, of a particular a nuclear, if you wish, family that uh, it was, uh, was um, taken into the, this, uh, the vortex of this, of this big tragedy. So um, I think they definitely can't turn around and tell you that it's unbelievable. <laughs> But you are right. If it was the fact, then it, it, it would be too much to, to believe. Um, I agree with that. And, um, well, I am planning and hoping to get over across the pond again, uh, probably, hopefully, within maybe six months or so. And I would love nothing better than to meet you me too. And it would be so wonderful. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm. I'm. I, I would be looking. I will be looking forward to that definitely. And um, I think, it, as as I said, if you um, need my humble uh, uh, contribution to the 
um, uh, whatever you you would like to prepare as a as a part of uh, I don't know scenario or movie or whatever. I'm I'm really um, um, here to to help if you need my help. Thank you. In, uh, understanding Rostro, not only just knowing the the uh, facts about him, but I think I understand him very well. Uh, when you read about the person, you know you understand. Sometimes uh, it's interesting that I imagined. And I was talking to, to uh, his, uh, for some reason, I, I'm, I was writing, I, I write a little bit like small stories. So I wrote a story when his uh, Liverpool um, house was, I imagined, uh, uh, built up of the red brick. I don't know why. It turned, it turned out a couple of months uh, after that it was the red brick. I just imagine it for some reason that he would like a house built, <laughs> built with a red brick. I saw a house. I remember what stood out to me was uh, there was a window, I believe, in one of the rooms that was almost like a bridge. That is and Southampton. That, that is a, his Southampton house, which was a, a white, like a white house. Yes. And the the, the part of it was like a bridge. Uh, it's again, interesting thing that people imagine that he would like to, to, to have, have it as a bridge. And even the, the guy who bought this, this house, um, I think 10 years ago, he was, he was a Rostron fan. In fact, he bought the house because of this house belonging at some time, obviously not immediately because someone else was, uh, uh, was uh, uh, well, someone else owned this house for, for a while between, but he bought this house because of Rostam. And that's his idea. Interesting thing is, again, a little bit of misconception from my point of view. Uh, very firmly, he said when he was retiring that this uh, page of my life is closed, he said. Now I'm going to spend the whole life with my family and kind of dedicated to my family. He was very keen on the on on uh, flowers. He was uh, he had a, a huge garden. He was looking after his uh, roses and everything. And he loved being in the in the he said it's also a nature for me, like that we see the nature. This is a nature. I don't think he uh, it might, might be a coincidence, but I don't think when he finished the chapter, when he closed the chapter, he retired from the sea. He retired from the sea. So he wasn't nostalgic at all. So he was doing a lot of stuff. He was the president of Nautical Club in Southampton. He was, again, writing a lot of books and, and chapters. I have a couple of chapters of him in other books about um, the ships, and he loved the ships, everything. But he, he that, that his uh, family was now his priority after he retired. So I think this is, it might be, um, I think it was already, uh, it, it might have attracted him that it looked like a bridge, but I don't think he would have be sitting there and nostalgic about the, the he wasn't nostalgic. He finished with that. He achieved, as he said, he achieved the, what else he could have achieved? He was a knight. He was a, a commodore of the of the line. Uh, there was nothing for him to achieve, and, and he spent forty two years in, in the sea. So now he was uh, uh, trying to kind of um, pay more attention and um, and look after his family. Um, and another thing that uh, it's just uh, before we part, <laughs> uh, it's it's a funny misconception because it's uh, uh, replicated everywhere. Everywhere where you see, and that's actually James Bissett's uh, um, fault, because he wrote, and I don't know, I don't think he would have written that, but uh, Bissett's book are the collaborations with the professional writer. So I think what was happening that Bissett, because he wrote a lot of books, he was kind of um, uh, talking to and 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 uh, recalling then, and the writer was writing. And I think it was a, a, the writer's mistake uh, because Bisset would have known. He writes everywhere that he, they considered uh, Rosson to be like a saint because uh, I know why, because he was never interested in, he himself said, in this, um, uh, the entertainment in the port. You are, so whatever, whatever it means. So he would never go to, 
even even before he was married, he would never go to drink uh, beer or to go to uh, to meet to meet ladies, let's say, or something that never. That wasn't his, that wasn't what he liked, and he would never do that. Uh, but uh, the officers considered him to be. Uh, to be like a, a, a uh, pious person because um, not only because of that, but also because he never swore, he never drank, and Bisa said he never smoked. And this is incorrect. I have a dozen of his photographs with a cigarette in his hand. So he did smoke. <laughs> he, he, he did smoke. So that wasn't uh, the, uh, th this is not true. Everything else is. But this is part because they thought if he's a saint, he wouldn't smoke, but he did smoke. <laughs> and there's nothing bad about smoking. <laughs> but he never drank, that, 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 that never drank. This is right. And never, the only thing that he drank, he never liked drinking at all. But at home, maybe a couple of glasses of wine. When he was on the ship, it was only orange juice, nothing else ever. And I like the way he, in a very British way, he, he swore when he uh, heard uh, Cotton kind of a, uh, a guy wide opening his door and rushing. He said, who the Dickens is this chicken beggar? So this is a kind of a swearing. I like it, of course, it, it, there's no, not a single swear word in that, but that's kind of a, he even didn't say who the hell, he even did, didn't use this word, but who the dickens is this chicken beggar? <laughs> I've never heard that say. Yes, it's a very, very, very English, very English. Who the dickens is this chicken beggar? So he kind of, uh, uh, that's the way, uh, like if you wish, of course, it's not swearing, but that's the, the maximum he could, he could say. Or, 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 so he definitely, as uh, Bissett said, he wasn't a typical uh, type of the captain, the sea captain. And never, he had never uh, raised his voice to officers, but for some reason, because he had, they said, a couple of people were, more than a couple of people saying that he had piercing, uh, almost fluorescenting blue eyes, piercing fluorescenting, almost like he was hypnotizing people. And when he, he used to give the orders with very, very low voice, very quietly, looking with his eyes, people just obeyed. Yeah. <laughs> so that's well, the... God was there on the April 15th and put the right person in charge. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. As he said very famously in a letter to the friend, and I have the original, of, not the original text, I mean, not the original letter, oh. but the original text, because again, it, it is incorrectly... Uh, quoted in many places that uh, a hand uh, uh, other than mine was on the wheel that that night. That's what he said. Because he was he was um, um, an absolute believer in the providence. He was very, um, as he said, I didn't run around with a Bible in my hand on the on the ship, of course. But every time when before before the the, the journey, he would. Uh, um, uh, pray uh, in his cabin and uh, every time when he, he and everyone knew that um, he would uh, enter the port of his uh, des final destination he will take the cap off and just say something like like a pray or thank you to, to God yeah <laughs> well yes. we'll have to do another interview only on sir Rostron, sir. <laughs> no. I think I learned such a lot from you today, and I'm so uh, excited about you know your family history. As I said, it's so much more than this uh, this particular night to remember. Uh, after, of course, but even even more so before, um, and all the uh, struggles they they went through. It's amazing, and it's also to a certain extent typical, unfortunately. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah for um, the people in, in in that time in that yes. part of the world absolutely yes and um 
Yeah, so I'm, I'm looking forward to, to hearing more and getting more information from you and this recording. I'll uh, see what, what went wrong, why I wasn't allowed to, uh, to, to go to the link. And um, I'm going to go and uh, see if I can just change the permission on it. Uh, I you think you can... permit it to my um, email address. I think that's the... the uh, or the Google, it's a Google Doc. Yes, it's a Google yes, Doc. Yes, I believe so. Yeah, then then the, the Google name would be fine. Which is? Either Alina or Nina, both. I have I have both the Google names. Will you uh, <laughs> send me a message with yes, that? I'll send you a message. I think that my, my Google is tuned and synchronized with Alina. So if you could just, uh, yeah, allow Alina to, yeah. All right. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. Thank you. I, I'm I'm so pleased that we we we, we are friends now, and uh, I hope and um, um, so interesting talking to you. I could have done for for more. I think we are talking for two hours now, and at least spent like five minutes. Well, so. maybe we can do it again. I would like to, and I would like to come over there maybe and do another one. Um, I need to spend, I spent about a week researching in the uh, Maritime Museum in London mm -hmm. because Walter Lord actually donated yeah. his papers there. So, uh, you know, that was amazing going there and researching in there. And uh, so it was interesting. I also had an acquaintance of Robert Hitchens great grandson. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, I'm in London. Uh, are you and your wife interested in coming to London? And, you know, I'll show you the museum and everything. So he came up and we had lunch and uh, I mm -hmm. kind of introduced him to that library and the papers. And he, you know, he was just mind blown because there's so much there. But I also mm -hmm. encourage you to go there. You know, I have a very rare interview. I think it was published in 1960s. I'll have a look in my, my archive of the young man who went to visit Rostron when he was, I think, 19 or 20 years old. Uh, and he was a student then. And uh, he, of course, was fascinated by the whole story and everything he wanted to, as hero, captain, sir, and everything, wanted to meet him. And um, he went, he actually came to, to Southampton arrived to Southampton from the US, he was American. And he just called the number, obviously there were not so many telephone numbers in the book that time. It was, I think, 1935-ish or 34-ish. And he talked to his daughter, the, the, uh, his daughter Margaret was considerably younger than his sons. And uh, at that time she was already 22 or 21. And uh, she said, what, 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 you know, why would you like to, to, to talk to? And he said, I'm from the States and I'm a, a, a journalist student. And he came to the phone immediately because he was so keen on, he uh, Rostron really liked Americans very much and um, America liked Rostron very much. And uh, he, he was always a, a good friend of the, of the US really. And he mm -hmm. said that when someone was from the States, he was just like open to, to and he asked, he asked, just come over and, and see me. So he went to see him and uh, he told, um, after, after he, he, uh, they met, I have this uh, kind of description of the meeting and everything and a lot of uh, interesting information. He went back to the US. Actually, he gave him a, one of the uh, roses from his garden and he had this dried rose uh, then, then um, kept it for, for a long time. And he went to the library to work on something. He met there Walter uh, Lord, mm -hmm. and he told him about this meeting with uh, Captain Rostron. And uh, he was absolutely sure that that was the time and the moment when uh, uh, Lord conceived the idea of writing about the A Night to Remember. Wow. So that actually was, he was, at least he says in his, uh, that I'm absolutely sure 
due, based on the conversation we had with Walter Lord, who, did, who hasn't yet written the, the A Night to Remember, that that was the starting point that I sparkled this interest in him in writing this novel. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That so I have this. Good. I will. I will send you this very interesting. Uh, the uh, a, la a large um, uh, the um, paper. The 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 article. Please, that would be yeah. awesome. And if yeah. anything can send you, just let me know. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so <laughs> thank you so much for agreeing to do this, thank and you. I know my will be absolutely completely fascinated <laughs> so anytime i'm happy to be of um of help thank you very much i greatly appreciate thank it thank you very much Shelley. Okay. it was really great seeing you face to face yes you too and we'll stay in touch yeah Post absolutely time. get take good care of yourself you too bye thank you bye bye, bye.